I got a bang ready. That conversation that they just had would not go down on a radio because there could be guys inside that understand English and would hear that they're about to throw a flashbang in. The three guys in front that you can see, that's you know, about that 15 meter dispersion that we like. I would want to not expose my body to whatever's up the stairs. That unknown is my immediate threat. Oh, so these guys actually have like an overhead. That's very cool. Very small, quick gripe about all of those little white dots being so close to each other is normally you'd want to have a little bit more of what we refer to as dispersion. You know, at night, you think you're okay. You definitely want to be close enough to where you have an idea of where all of you are. All of these guys have night vision, which I'm super happy about. You know the enemy is not going to be utilizing night vision, like uh, infrared strobes on your helmet or plate carrier, what have you, that would uh, let someone know from a little bit further away that you're around, uh, someone friendly. Normally want to be kind of like 15, 20 meters apart from the next guy to where you could look over, see him kind of in the distance. But if you were to start taking indirect fire from mortars or uh, small arms fire from around, you don't want to be like so close to each other to where you run the risk of losing more guys at once. Night vision, for sure, in this scenario, uh, hopefully something that has a little bit of a magnification to it. Night vision optics would work great. Since they're running with an overhead, you would rely heavily on your comms guys, forward observers, JTACs, uh, anybody in that kind of space that has that direct line of communication with the overhead. And you're gonna hear to me refer to the overhead a lot. What I'm talking about is those guys on those planes where it was showing the very beginning of a whole like thermal image of the battlefield. ISAR is going to have a uh, security or go defensive once we're up. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't want four guys shoulder to shoulder on top of a hill. Solid intel on QRF. That QRF that he was just talking about, I really like this already. These guys seem like they know quite a bit about what they're talking about so far. The QRF is going to be the uh, quick response force. If they're assaulting that town or if they're trying to pull off some sort of snatch and grab, whatever objective might have been disseminated to them, they don't need all 50 guys going at once. If I can send one squad, possibly even two squads in and get that job done, depending on area we needed to cover, and uh, how many guns I want in the fight. I'm not gonna send all 50 if I can have 24 of them, 25 of them do that job. See, this is pretty good dispersion with these, the three guys in front that you can see. That's, you know, about that 15 meter dispersion that we like. And this is not. <laughs> yeah, this is LCC, so. These guys know what they're talking about. I, I'm gonna enjoy this quite a bit. The LCC brief is your last cover and concealment brief, typically given by a team commander. Things that will be given to you in an LCC brief is like primary direction of flow and CQB. So if I'm going into a building, I don't have a team splitting into two because half the guys wanna go left and half the guys wanna go right. Yeah, those infrared lasers that they're using there is a great way to communicate with your RBE or your QRF, especially if they can see where you are and they can see where the contact's coming from. If I've got a direct line with them and I don't have to do anything more than turn on a laser that they can't even see and sweep around the area. Done two, done three. I'd be willing to bet that their QRF leader is, is a machine gunner in some capacity because he's employing his machine gun teams very well. I would be very happy to have him in a, in a gunfight with me. You're not gonna find a lot of difficulty even call outs in a mission until stress starts to run really high which there's you know other ways around that but uh these guys here it seems like they have the the time with each other the reps doing it over and over again to where they communicate as a team pretty copacetically you know like there's not a lot of hiccups or you know whoa what'd you say <laughs> in their calm traffic watch uh north side of Shit. building a lot of the gear that these guys are using is Real gear. I see that guy's got a Maul, B Myers Maul, EOTech. Looks like mod lights on these guns. Badger charging handles. Like these guys have like all the the real deal stuff. A lot of it's behind me right over here. One one. The Eagles clearing twenty series buildings. Time down. A lot of good communications in this one for sure. I got a BTR full of troops coming in from the northwest on the MSR. MSR is 
main supply route. So that's going to be like your main road, your main point of, uh, you know, vehicles are coming in or leaving. A lot of the times it could be the only paved road or just the widest road that's an actual route between locations. A lot of the times those farm roads could be your MSR. So that is something that you're going to have to pay attention to in the mission brief. Even this night vision is realistic. That's pretty much exactly what it looks like. Reaper, request sparkle on... Yeah, so that guy that was just talking, he's going to be like your, your JTAC or JTAC equivalent. Not sure if he actually is one, but he's the guy that's going to be talking with our eyes in the sky to close air support, really anything that you need from the planes, they're going to be able to visit with them and save your ass a lot of times. <laughs> those, those are some uh, helpful guys to have. Reloading, reloading. You know, he's got a second. He's trying to lay down fire. You know, there's nothing wrong with him doing that at all. Might be a little helpful if he could throw in the distance. So to know, I know I'm looking left. Am I looking... 10 meters in front of me? Am I looking 150 meters in front of me? So a lot of times with that ad rack, when you call attention and then you give your direction and your distance and you know, then if you have the time to be able to move a machine gun team over there, what have you, that's great. We saw that he did not, but you know, if I'm saying, you know, three contacts left, one, five, zero meters, everybody at least around me or on the same channel as me, which uh, the guys around him should be. Sick like just let it rim. So you're not supposed to cuss over comms, but uh, what he's saying is exactly right. He had two gun teams working in tandem doing what we call talking guns. So, you know, team one will give like three to five second bursts and then he'll stop and then gun team two will go. What this does is it kind of helps cool down barrels a little bit because as you're shooting, it looks like a couple of these guys have 249 saws, a couple of them have 240s it appears, both of which a barrel change is pretty easy, but if I don't absolutely have to do it, I, I'm not gonna want to, especially if I'm covering a team that's already there or if I've got people shooting back at us. Roger that. One, one, cross. You see him marking and he can see it coming from the overhead. It is kind of difficult with the corner fed room, like corner fed opening to the right with having a staircase to the left. That's just an overall kind of odd scenario to be in. A one kind of saving grace, it seems like they have is the enemy does not have night vision, which could make it safer for him to stand there because I, I would want to not expose my body to whatever's up the stairs. That unknown is my immediate threat. What they are pretty successfully doing here is something that we have simplified into an acronym as SOSRA. Suppress, obscure, secure, reduce, and assault through. So they are at the R right now because they have suppressed the enemy from the QRF, the guys up on the hill when they were shooting into the town on their machine gun teams and everything that gave our other team or our forwardmost two teams, I believe it was two teams, gave them time to set up, give their LCC brief. And then obscuring was done by the overhead, the plane. You saw them, you know, shooting that uh, BTR, shooting down whatever other vehicles they had coming in. They were able to kind of create that fog of war for the enemy. You know, things are on fire, things are getting blown up. They're going to assault through now. It kind of looks like they're on their way to do, to either move to the next objective or uh, RTB. So I guess we're about to see. The protocol for calling airstrikes has entirely to do with that uh, that JTAC that I've kind of mentioned a couple times. I have not, I definitely haven't done myself. Ford observers could, those guys will have the tools necessary to call airstrikes. And that's, that is their kind of primary job on the battlefield. And it helps out that it seems like by and large, there's some, some pretty damn good gunfighters too. Intel reports that he lives in a small village on the side of it. So what we're getting now is that mission brief that I have been touching on a little bit. And this is where everybody is kind of getting on the same page about what's going on. So this guy is doing a great job of explaining it in pretty like civilian friendly terms to where we know what's going on. So we're not just watching people just getting gunfights and they could have like certain call outs or anything that we might not understand. So these guys are basically giving us the viewer a mission brief and then we'll probably hear the last cover concealment brief as well. 
So when you're given your mission brief, typically you will have a primary, secondary, and tertiary plan. So you'll have a couple of fall throughs in case of whatever million things that can go wrong do go wrong. You know, Murphy's Law unit leaders are, are typically, you know, I don't want to say all the time, I always had great ones, but mission leaders are always privy to that, that kind of Murphy's Law way of thinking and have at least two kind of backup plans. So do you see on the top right of the screen where it says use tapped on the right shoulder? That is such a cool thing to put in there because when they're conducting the CQB inside of this building here, we always had tricep squeezes or kind of like right under your butt cheek, like kind of the back of that thigh hamstring kind of area, you get squeezed. His job is attacking the crack, you know, making sure nobody's trying to open that door or come through that door, or if he can see anything, he's trying to get kind of a beat on what's going on inside of there. And then the guy behind him is going to also try to assist him in any way of pieing those corners or getting a look inside that door. But then their responsibility as the second man is to make sure the team behind them is ready. And then they are going to let the point man know by like the tap on the right shoulder, it looks like what they have here. That's why we really like that under the butt cheek squeeze is because what in the world else is gonna happen where you're gonna get like just squeezed right up under your butt there. I got a bang ready. That conversation that they just had would not go down on a radio because there could be guys inside that understand English and would hear that they're about to throw a flashbang in. So normally they give a hand and arm signal. It typically looks a lot like that, like a little open and close, open and close. And so when your point man is holding inside the door, making sure that nobody's going to come around and start shooting at them while they're getting the flashbang ready, the second man will go ahead, throw the flashbang into the room and they can go inside. Vehicle coming. Get ready, guys. PID. PID. PID is positive identification. They know their HVI is going to come. Car, he might be in one of those cars. Not everybody in there is going to be a contact. They were instructed to take this guy alive. So our total pack down is now two zero, correct? Uh, with the HVI, correct? A. Uh... Yeah, so when they're talking about like their pack numbers and stuff, that's just how many people they have. So he was just confirming we had 19 before. I've got the HVI, so we're now carrying 20 packs. As, and that would be for the team leader to let their ride basically know how many people they're coming to pick up. I'd be blown away if these guys weren't military of some type. Top yeah. yeah. You just snap pictures Nothing of that? Nothing interacts I'll take there, a picture guys. of it. What they're doing now is called a side exploitation. So that would be, you know, finding this radio here. It probably has some pretty valuable information as far as like enemy comms goes. The lap could have anything from troop movement, uh, whatever plans they might have. It could be anything. So Arma 3, I'm blown away. That was fantastic. Realism scale, I, I think we got a 10 here. I'd put my good name on it as a 10 for realistic as far as the gear that they're using, as far as the guys that we were following around and listening to them communicate. They have a very firm understanding of their jobs and what to do and how to do it as safely and as effective as possible. I think that that was a lot of fun to watch. I had a great time. I'm comfortable giving a 10 to Arma 3. All right, guys, that is it for Arma 3. If you would like more Experts React, go ahead and check out Gameology's Facebook and YouTube pages. If you would like more of me personally, my work, YouTube, and Instagram is Aaron's Gun Cabinet. And as always, remember to stay mentally, spiritually, and physically prepared. Thank you. Sick link. Just let it rip. <laughs>